Ontario service providers and the Workforce Planning Board of York Region are hosting this event. You can see all our lovely logos below. There are nine Employment Ontario centres in York Region to support job seekers in their job search and employers with finding talent. We are funded by the provincial government to provide free employment services. You can find the closest Employment Ontario Centre by going to www wpboard.ca slash employment Ontario. But the big question today is, are you considering a career in computer and information technology? We have great guest speakers to help you learn about IT opportunities in York region. It is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this event who will guide our discussion today, Craig Stryker, the president and CEO of Onico Solutions, which provides IT staffing and IT resource consulting services. His knowledge of the IT industry will help him moderate this great group of speakers and provide some insight into the exciting and fulfilling industry. Thank you, Craig, for joining us today, and I will leave this event in your hands now. Thanks, Kayla. Great to be here, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for attending. Uh, it's a great time, actually, to be considering uh, a career or a change into IT. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, the past... I'd say in the past 22 years in, that we've been in business, we've seen uh, the past two years, especially because of COVID, a, a tremendous increase in the demand for IT resources. And it's only highlighted the talent shortage in, in our industry. So it's great that you know, you're considering a career in it and certainly a very prosperous time despite COVID. So the way we're gonna start today is we're gonna have Tina talk a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna introduce actually Tina Stevens, who's a project manager over with the Workforce Planning Board of York Region. Talk a little bit about what's going on in our region. Uh, Workforce Planning Board is one of 26 local boards across the province that work with employers, regional government and agencies to support job seekers and increase awareness in the local employment market in their respective areas. So Tina is going to give us a little overview of what's going on in our region, you know, so that you understand, you know, what, what it potentially looks like and, you know, take it away, Tina, I'll leave it with you. Thanks, Craig, and welcome, everyone. York Region is uh, Canada's second largest technology hub and has the highest density of ICT companies among Canadian tech hubs. Six of Greater Toronto Area's 10 top 10 ICT corporate and R&D investors with headquarters or major operations are located in York Region. 8.6% of the region's workforce is ICT, which equates to over 60,000 jobs in the region. The tech sector in York is made up of self-employed individuals, gig workers, startups, scale-ups, and large global employers. The area around Highway 404 and Highway 407 is York's most tech-focused real estate market. Concentration can also be found along Highway 400 and in Northern York region in the Newmarket Aurora area. The largest number of tech companies are in the scale-up uh, portion of the industry or small businesses that have experienced success and are expanding and often have a need for more talent. So what jobs are currently in demand in the region? Over 130 employment opportunities currently exist in York Region for computer and information system professionals in five different occupations. This information can be found on the WP board website under Work in York. It provides detailed labor market information about each of the occupations, as well as the actual job postings related to each occupation. This is all in real time. Job postings can be accessed by clicking on the box containing the number. Another 40 employment opportunities currently exist in the region for technical occupations in computer and information systems. This data can be found in the Work in York Career Library tool and is free to all residents. This information is very current and changes hourly as the Work in York tool updates over 20,000 jobs in York region. Tech jobs 
are not confined just to the tech industry. These types of jobs can also be found in manufacturing, finance, insurance, wholesale and retail trade, transportation, education, healthcare, and public administration. Work in York is a series of job finding tools and career development tools that can be accessed on the WP board website. You can search by job title, employer, or create customized searches. Occupations are also search searchable by NOC or National Occupation Code, which classifies all occupations in Canada. Working York Career Library Tool lists the salary range, the skills required for each occupation, as well as regional employers who have posted for the occupation in the last 12 months. That provides a great networking opportunity for job seekers and current job postings. You can also identify other industry where IT jobs can be found. Similar labor market information can be found for other areas of the province through the Workforce Planning Boards of Ontario or the link above. That's great. Over 40 different post job postings locally and nationally and updates every hour. If you are job searching or career exploring, this is the tool for you and it's free. Back to you, Craig. Awesome, thanks, Tina. I guess just a reminder to everyone who's participating today to please mute your microphone uh, so that the speakers can be heard and we'll answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so. Thank you again, Tina. Very great overview of our sector. And as I mentioned, lots of things going on in IT. And, you know, our community is growing and we're looking forward to, you know, helping you find uh, a, a prosperous career in IT. So we're going to divide this, uh, I guess, session into two parts. One is talking with some employers in our region, as well as some trainers and tra uh, what training is available to you. I want to start off by doing some, asking some questions of some employers, and I'll introduce them. First, I want to introduce uh, Jason Zwig from Canadian Viewpoint. And uh, Canadian Viewpoint, what began as a paper-based research company 40 years ago, has evolved into a real-time interactive data collection company. Technology has enabled Canada Viewpoint to better deliver faster and more cost-effective results for their clients. Welcome, Jason. Craig. Uh, next, I want to welcome Chris Lamont from Cashland. Uh, Cashland designs software to help solar farm owners manage, operate, and obtain necessarily uh, financial data as well as diagnose issues. Welcome, Chris. Thanks. Happy to be here. And lastly, we welcome Fariel Carbassi from Ed Kent Media which is a leading digital marketing company offering a full suite of web design, awesome. content marketing, social media marketing, and custom digital marketing services. Welcome, Fariel. I'm going to start off by asking a, a, some, a series of questions, and I'm going to direct them at our panelists to sort of answer and give us some insight as to you know, some of the things that, some of these questions you may have. And of course, if we haven't answered them, I would encourage you to put them into the chat and you know, we'll try and get to them at the end of, a, of this presentation or if not answer them via email. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin with you, Jason, uh, for our first question. And if you could sort of uh, let us know what are the possible IT career paths in your organization? Sure. Um, multiple. Um, you know, so the Canadian viewpoint, uh, you know, as you said, it's a, it's a digital data collection company is in the market research space. We'd be the people that ask questions. We might call you at six o'clock in the evening, ask you to do a survey on the phone or stop you at a mall to do a survey or, you know, or, or do online surveys. So uh, just to give some context in terms of who we are. So the most obvious IT path is within our tech team. Uh, this team builds custom tools and writes custom scripts to help us deliver for both internal and external clients. Um, the path within there, uh, entry level would be people who have um, some 
a development experience. We start, start as a programmer and analyst, move up to a developer, become team leads and, and directors. Uh, we also have a survey programming team who script online surveys for our external clients. Uh, people can start within that with uh, um, uh, limited, uh, it's much more entry level and, and limited uh, tech experience as a junior programmer, moving into senior programmer, becoming team leads, programming managers, directors is kind of the path there. And even our client service team, including project and account managers live within technology. Yeah, I mean, um, so d development seems to be a big thing that you, you've highlighted. Any particular technologies that you guys focus on per se, any types of you know, development um, languages that you guys are using? Yeah, so I mean, our tech team uses the, the LAMP stack. Um, so Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, Perl, Python uh, end up being the languages that we play with them. Um, we, uh, uh, the team uses frameworks. Uh, we use the Laravel uh, MVC framework. Um, uh, our team are, are, are CSS experts uh, in terms of you know, manipulating you know, front end. Um, Ajax, uh, super important uh, you know, within um, uh, jQuery uh, also. Um, so lots of languages in order to, you know, and, and frameworks in order to help um, uh, pull it off. It's, yeah. it's more front end or is it back end or is it both? A combination of the two. Um, you know, we're creating front end uh, deliverables for our internal and external clients, uh, a, a huge amount of back end as it relates to the, the data warehousing and, and processing. And, and uh, um, so both, and, and then tying it together in dashboards and visualizations. Okay. Do you, do you folks generally hire contract? Do you hire firm? What's, what, what do you guys generally look for in terms of? Uh, yeah, Pre predominantly inside. You know, inside. Uh, so pre you know, we, we, we usually hire full-time permanent uh, uh, is the, our typical route. Perfect, awesome. Thank you, Jason. I'm gonna uh, pose the same question to you, Chris. Um, what are the possible IT career paths in, in your particular organization? Yeah, sure. So um, I can comment on the on some of the roles that we have uh, hired for uh, before through um, through um, EO um, system. And so just as a little bit of, as far as what we do, um, as far as our web and data stack, uh, quite similar to uh, what Jason described, uh, you know, as far as LAMP stack, you're talking about a full stack uh, from a product perspective of you have a bunch of work on the front end from the visualization on CSS to HTML to the Java script that then uh, sends and interacts with the server backend. And then of course, all of everything from the data processing uh, to pipelines to the data visualization. And of course, how that ultimately gets consumed. Uh, one thing as well is because of what we do uh, to kind of give a slightly expanded explanation of what uh, our organization does. In many ways, what we do is we actually deploy IT or IoT solutions to a bunch of industrial equipment that exists on solar farms all across Ontario, Canada, and globally. And what that really means is, I know IoT can sound a lot like a buzzword, but really what it is, is you're talking about a small computer that has some sort of embedded system on it. And in our case, and what I see often, it's Linux. So you have an embedded Linux system that exists in some network that's usually connected by a cellular. And then we have that computer with special protocols talking to the different sensors and equipment that exist on a solar site, collect that data, process the data, and then send it through the workflow similar to what Jason mentioned. So uh, a big part of that uh, is that, that we find, and actually I, I think is a skill that is so broadly useful across uh, a multitude of IT organizations and is not trendy uh, are networking skills. And so networking skills are vital, uh, particularly when you talk about connectivity of data and connectivity of devices. And it's, you know, knowledge of networking translates across every single uh, role in, in IT. Um, so even if you're a backend developer, 
it's something that is really useful to know. Um, and uh, I'm not familiar with all of the trainings that are out there for that, uh, but it's definitely one of those aspects that whether going back to your original question about roles. Uh, so on one hand, we have our production team, which they in many ways assemble these industrial boxes with the modem, the gateway or computer, and any kind of sensors and circuits that then gets assembled and then shipped to a site. Uh, so that's kind of roughly equivalent to building a computer in your house if you were to build a desktop and have that be programmed. Uh, and then you also have uh, support. So for example, this goes to IT support. So this is really helping support the networks so that we have deployed. Fine. That's not gonna help you. Uh, and yeah, and so you have those networks deployed. And then of course, everything um, similar to what Jason mentioned, as far as you have, sorry, Neurosyn, I think you need to- uh, give me one minute, Matt. Yourself. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so of course, many different development roles and uh, just kind of things. And I think ultimately in the ICT space, uh, there is a lot of cross uh, cross utility, uh, and so I think if the focus is on you know learning how to um, use these things and um, you know to to find useful applications, then I think that's can I start with the phone number first. Nurusen, I think you need to mute yourself. Nurusen's yeah. iPhone. Thank you. Just a reminder to everyone to please mute your microphones while we're having this discussion. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, so if I understood you correctly, so there were a few things that you touched on. One was development, right? Uh, both front end and back end development. Um, yeah, so I would, uh, so, so that's an aspect of it. I mean, we, um, I, I think we, we, we don't hire for, for like front end development and then back end development. Um, you know, we're very small, so we look at it holistically and then evaluate uh, based right. on the case. Uh, but as far as the work that we have involved, we have lots of both, right? That's just yeah. a, a part of it. Yeah. And then you mentioned networking yes. because you mentioned Linux. So um, is it more of a Linux, which is a, you know, free source, you know, type of, you know, back end? Is it Linux that you're more focused on? Is it Windows based? Is it both? Um, we're, we're primarily Linux. So, um, so again, from an embedded system perspective, while there are uh, some operating systems, we actually, uh, I think many people on the call may know if they're um, familiar or hobbyists with, with IT and technology, uh, we actually, it, for some sites, deploy Raspberry Pis. And a Raspberry Pi is ultimately, you've got Linux on there, um, a special form of it, and then that's just really a computer at the end of the day that's connected into a network. Right. And then you also mentioned support along all of these things, obviously troubleshooting these issues as they come in and what have you. Yep, exactly. So, um, and also helping customers either get the data that they need from the product um, or helping them use the product to get connected, uh, right. networking items like that. And obviously because you're related to solar energy, this is obviously a growing field. I mean, you know, I think we're, we're all realizing that more and more we have to be less dependent on uh, on fuel, on you know, on gas. So obviously we're going to probably make even more of a push now with unfortunately what's going on in in Ukraine uh, more towards solar energy, right? Absolutely, yeah, uh, yeah. The world, uh, and I mean, just as a fun fact about solar, is the costs are competitive in, in most parts of the world, unsubsidized for solar, and uh, kind of a little broad with ICT and technology the costs of technology are dropping at an exponential rate. Uh, that's the case for processors. That's the case for, you know, across the spectrum on the technology platforms, but that also includes solar energy and lithium ion batteries, et cetera. And that's really uh, the framework for uh, what will power the future. Right. So it's giving the folks here a good insight as to what some potential future careers are going to look like in IT, because this is what, you know, as, you know, someone who's been in the industry for over 22 years, you know, the people that we find that are very successful in our industry are people who sort of can see what the trends are, what development languages are coming out, what technologies are coming out and bridge the gap between what they currently know to be able to, you know, just start playing with those technologies, getting some experience and that eventually can lead to them growing into that particular field. So that would be a suggestion I would have for people looking, you know, to expand in their IT career. 
And um, yeah, so thank you, Chris. Absolutely uh, valid. Thank, thanks so much. Mariel, uh, I would ask you the same question as well. What are the possible IT career paths in your organization? Or is your microphone not working? Okay, unfortunately right now, Kavariel, I cannot hear you. So if you wanna, what I can do is I can move on to the next question. And if you can get your microphone working, that's great. And if not, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, any questions can be directed to you later on if that works. Yes, we're unable to hear you. Okay, so Fariel is going to try and rejoin us. So uh, let's go proceed on to uh, question number two. And we'll probably touch a lot on the similar, uh, these are all going to intertwine these questions, uh, but let's, let's ask it anyways. And Chris, if you can lead us off on this one as well, what are the skills that your organization looks for for new hires? And I mean, you know, we've touched on some of them, but you know, if you want to rehash some of these skills or, you know, maybe related towards soft skills, personality, education, that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say that a really big part of it and, uh, you could say that this is one of the things that when you're interviewing someone for uh, an IT role, that's one of the things that's important. Um, I do come from the philosophy that it is actually a lot less about uh, the specific, say, technologies that you worked on in the past uh, and more about us evaluating what is the background knowledge of the concepts that are related to that technology, as well as your ability to uh, adapt and pick up new things because, hey, maybe we want to actually add a new technology that's not in our stack today later. And so what is maybe your ability to uh, take on that and learn new things in a, uh, in a rapid way? Um, and of course, be really curious and excited about learning about these things. Um, I think that's one thing that we look for. I think that's a very valid point. I think, you know, when we look to hire people, it's more about attitude. It's more about how you approach a problem because you know if you're good with technology or you have an interest for it and an aptitude and a desire, you know new technologies are coming out all the time. It's impossible to know absolutely everything. And at the key of it is really your interest, your desire, your passion for learning these things, and an employer recognizing that because good employers will recognize somebody like that. And that's really what you know at least our company looks for. And it sounds like yours too, Chris in terms of we look for somebody, you know, what is really driving them? What is really making them, you know, have an interest in this particular position or, or in this particular field? And if they can convey it to us and we get a sense that, hey, you know what, they can do this, even though it may require learning, it may require some time, hey, we're always open to trying that because at the end of the day, things are gonna shift. And if they've demonstrated the ability to learn one thing, they're a very valuable asset going down the road when the technologies change and they have that attitude. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, same question to you, Jason. What are the skills that your organization looks for in, in new hires? Um, so uh, I would agree, um, you know, and, and say that we're, we're very similar uh, in that we're looking for people who can ultimately solve problems. And it's a matter of using the technology in order to, to help to solve that, those problems. The interesting thing that has come about over the last couple of years is, is really um, communication um, being such an important skill in a way that we hadn't uh, anticipated or seen really before. Uh, communication's always been very important and communicating to clients and communicating you know, internally, always very important. But now that we're living in this remote world, um, where uh, we're not seeing each other and we're not uh, being able to pick up on the same visual cues as we once before, once were before, uh, communication skills are becoming increasingly important in as a consideration for who it is that we are uh, onboarding and bringing into Canadian viewpoint. Yeah, it's, you know, it's very important that everyone's on the same page and being able to share ideas and understand where a person is coming from, especially when you're talking about you know, spending dollars behind it. Um, you know, you want everybody to sort of get the direction of a company. And yes, I agree with you. Communication is very, very important. Um, you know, and partnership, teamwork. 
uh, we find that that's very important, that people need to understand that, you know, for a successful company to operate, the most important thing is their people. And, you know, everyone's working together as a team. And it's very important to be able to support each other to, to achieve an endeavor or, you know, a development program or launch a product or any of those things. That it's very, very key. Awesome. Uh, Fariel, um, I saw that you were back. Is your, is your microphone working? I can see you in the video. Are you there? Yeah, I see you. Unfortunately, Fariel, we still can't hear you. Okay. Well, no worries. Let's, why don't we move on with uh, our third question and Fariel, I'll, I'll come back to you in a little bit and see if your microphone's working again and we'll go from there. Um, so well, my last question for our employ employer's panel is uh, where do you see the future of the IT industry as it relates to your particular business? And Jason, uh, if we can start with you. Uh, sure. Um, so within our industry, using AI and machine learning is gaining huge traction. Um, it's aiding in, in setting up surveys. Uh, so, so dealing with some of the scripting that we were doing before, uh, it, it, it's the ability to take a, a Word document and automatically have it build the, the online script, um, managing the projects. So where we used to send out invitations to people and manage quotas uh, and try and understand you know, who to send to, uh, you know, AI is doing this automatically for us and helping to optimize that. that. Uh, and in processing the data, you know, what, what used to be hand coded where we would take unstructured data uh, and understand, you know, and, and code what it was that people were saying uh, is now being done automatically. And you see that a lot just, you know, in sentiment analysis and, and you know, and, and specifically in our industry with, with respect to like uh, automatically coding those open end verbatim responses, uh, which allows our team to focus on the tasks that add value as opposed to the uh, repetitive tasks that, that can be done that way. Um, and I touched on it before, but data, data visualization uh, within our industry is, is huge and growing. Um, and the ability to both visualize the data and then ultimately to pull out, you know, to extract and tell the stories uh, is, is a valuable skill uh, into the future. You've hit on a lot of points. I mean, listen, we deal with a lot of clients that are exactly the same as you looking for data visualization, understanding what the data is doing, in particular, what their customers are doing. You know, they want to understand who they are, what they do, you know, to be able to better target them. Uh, as well, machine learning and AI to be able to automate things. You know, these are things that, you know, tedious repetitive tasks companies are looking to, you know, automate. So that way, you know, we can get on to more exciting stuff. And obviously employers are going to be more interested in the work that they're doing. So those are all really, uh, you know, future or current trends that we're seeing and will be continuing for some time. Um, what does it look like in terms of, you know, your particular office, uh, remote workforce, home, you know, hybrid? How's that going for you guys? You know, obviously there's been some changes with COVID, so it's interesting to hear what, what every company is kind of doing to combat that and how they're managing the workforce. We were entirely in person uh, at the start wow. of uh, at the start of COVID, and we've moved to uh, to entirely remote, and, and we we intend to um, largely stay that way. Um, uh, there's some work that we do that must be done in person. Um, you know, the, there's some fulfillment work that requires our, our team to actually be on site in order to pack stuff up. Uh, there's in person interviewing and sensory testing work where we need to have people smell products or try products and, and that work will have to continue to be done in person but um by and large our, our team is uh is continuing to work from home uh and, and we envision we'll continue to do so into the future right yeah it's it seems to be a trend and, and, and employees are asking for that you know with a preference and we've kind of gotten a little used to it but the one nice thing, you know, if we can call it that with COVID is everyone realized that we can function like this. This is the, one of the benefits that companies were kind of forced into a position. They were kind of contemplating, you know, remote workforce, in-person workforce, and now they were forced to, and they realized that productivity didn't really drop off. And, and in some cases, it actually went up because people weren't spending time commuting. In fact, for, for me personally, I find I work more 
because you, you don't really leave your work. You're always at work, which is which, which is a good and bad thing. But it's just something for you know the people on on this you know uh, chat to sort of you know take stock and to realize that this is what, kind of the shift that's happened, and understand that you know what, what we're seeing with clients is it's going to shift to primar primarily a hybrid environment, you know, and you know companies are going to balance that between what their workforce looks like to be able to keep costs down, don't have to have as big an office. What have you? Our, our industry association conducted a survey um, recently uh, amongst um, the employees within our industry, and 93% uh, of the employees indicated a desire to continue working from home primarily. Yeah, I'm not surprised. We hear that too. That's a primary request, and a lot of uh, you know hard to find positions, or a lot of people don't want to consider you know working in office at this point. It will shift over time, but right now, for the I'm going to say for at least the next year or so, you probably it'll probably remain like that because people have gotten used to this, and you know productivity really hasn't fallen off. Yeah. Chris, um, same question to you. Where do you see the future of the IT industry as it relates to your business? Uh, sure, um, I would say that a big part of it is um, that there is like definitely, as Jason mentioned, some machine learning applications that we're coming across. Uh, and I, again, I think that largely comes to, you know, understanding uh, how to implement uh, AI and ML tools really comes down to going to what I was commenting before about the versatility of learning and picking up new technologies. Um, I think looking ahead, I think in many ways um, it is, one of these kind of areas that I see as a continuing trend. And uh, it is one of those, uh, you could call it a buzzword as well, but it's really the whole cloud computing and what's going on with being familiar with the various cloud tools that are out there. Because uh, again, I'm not sure to the degree those on the call have kind of looked into it, but obviously of the major platforms, um, you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, but then you actually go and break into what these different tools do and it's kind of a maze of all of the different pieces uh and where things are the same and where things are different and ultimately from a you know from a company perspective we're looking at okay we have some sort of workload that we need to run and that could actually run in five different ways uh, across the different tools that they have because of just the functional overlapping and I think one of the aspects there is, you know, having knowledge of public cloud as well as just everything that's going on, uh, you know, particularly as there's also some shifts to loading things up as microservices um, or other kinds of, you know, workloads, either for data processing or, you know, you, you name it, uh, having that as a uh, skill in the tool belt uh, is important as it augments the kind of base uh, discussion around technology understanding. I don't know if that helps. No, I agree with you. You've touched, so you've touched on a few points you know, that are very important as well. Cloud computing definitely and the various services that are available, whether it be AWS or Azure or any of those uh, are, are highly sought in demand because as companies shift more to you know, cloud-based computing, or you know, they don't want to be responsible for their servers. They want to offload that responsibility uh, to you know, a, you know, a, a good service provider. And it's always good to understand which each one can provide for you, what the drawbacks are, what the limitations are, what the strengths are. And definitely, I would encourage people to look into that because we're getting a tremendous amount of requests for that in all areas whether it be networking, whether it be support, whether it be um, DevOps, any of those you know, careers that you're considering, they all involve cloud computing. And uh, you know, it's always good to have that in your toolkit and it can be a whole career just in that particular field. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, I think from, from our perspective or, or my perspective on it is it's one thing to, I think, get a certification or you know, there's, there's so many things out there. But what I look for is always, uh, how do you apply that in some sort of practical setting? Uh, because I think the real challenge or interesting component 
when I look at all of the cloud computing tools out there is where the rubber meets the road. And you can, like, there's so many projects and tutorials out there that you can just spin up and try things out and uh, run to those things. Um, and, you know, I, I think projects as a part of the IT, ICT space um, mm -hmm. to kind of demonstrate and talk about, hey, you know, I did this and I ran into this problem. And that's why, you know, I was originally planning on building it out this way. And then I, you know, tried Kubernetes and then had some, or, or whatever this situation is. And I think that uh, with cloud computing, you know, specifically where the rubber meets the road as far as some kind of workflow, I think is where um, things are particularly interesting to have a conversation with the Absolutely. Employer. Great, awesome. Thanks, Chris. Fariel, um, are you, uh, are, I see- I think it should finally work now. Are you guys yeah. able to? Hooray. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Leslie. So I connected from my phone. I have no clue what's going on with my laptop. It's uh, one of those technology glitches. Um, and today we are talking about IT and technology. Um, well, I did try to job, answer. Right? Sorry. That's why we have a job, right? Because there exactly. are. Exactly. I guess, I guess, you know, yes, that's why. And, and uh, thank you, um, everybody, for patiently waiting. I tried answering one of the questions, and I think it was the first one um, in the chat channel. I uh, hope everyone was able to review that, but just let me know which one of the questions you'd like me to answer and I'll be happy to go over them. Okay, well, let, let's, start with, let's start with the question we're at because we wanna keep pace with the timing as well. Um, so uh, the question uh, in this case is, where do you see the future of the IT industry as it relates to your particular business? Um, so for us, and I think I just in regards to like the roles I touched upon it as well, we're a little bit particular. Um, and the reason I can't really talk too much about like our industry, because it's kind of in like a stealth mode, we are in fundraising. Um, it is a part of Etkent Media, it, it does fall under that umbrella. Uh, but mainly like the technologies or the stacks and the frameworks that we are working on would be more for like back end engineers. Um, in regards to front-end engineers, it would be uh, more mean, but CSS, HTML, and all of those would be a big component to it as well. Uh, Full-stack developers, um, I would say we're very focused on API as the technology itself is built on an API, um, and it mm -hmm. is a SaaS platform. So for us, it would be really more just related to like technical uh, skill sets, nothing tangible as we are not into like hardware computing and things of that nature. Um, we're relatively smaller right now, everybody that is focused on this role, but I would say the engineering team is um, growing at like a fast pace in comparison to everything else, as that's where the product comes into play. Secondary to that, I would be uh, thinking product managers is definitely something that is going to be key and vital because what we realize based on the demands that we are getting from a lot of our consumers and uh, prospects, they are looking for a lot of sub products. Um, I think some of the things that are trending um, in particular to like IT or like not so much maybe necessarily relevant to like our industry, uh, Salesforce, HubSpot, like specialists in like, you know, being developers because a lot of people are trying to like integrate nowadays with like, you know, these technologies. And now if you are a specialist in that um, and what they call them is like a native integrator. And I think focusing on that, if that is your forte, would certainly give you like a big upper hand for like the roles and uh, titles that you're applying for. Post pandemic, I guess things have changed a lot. So I feel like you have access to the globe now. So if Ontario is not working out for you, change your region to like, you know, something else where it's not as competitive and employers are not looking for like, you know, years and years of experience. It's a very good point you brought up. First of all, A, in terms of Ontario and the world. So at the end of the day, when you think about it, because most of us are working remotely, yeah. Not only Ontario that you necessarily need to focus your job search. You can oh. focus throughout Canada. Yeah. You can focus throughout the world. So long yeah. as you're comfortable working in a particular time zone. A lot yeah. of employers are looking for this, and that's one of their edges, that their employer is flexible and open to that. That gives them an yeah. advantage. So that is a yeah. very, very good point, and certainly yeah. a good tool for people to keep in mind for employers that are open and flexible to workforce outside of their particular province. Yeah. Yeah, um, for sure. You mentioned Salesforce as well. You know, we see a big uptick in those types of technologies yeah. where, you yeah. know, integrating of data, of systems, of reporting. You know, yeah. when you think about it, how a company is run, you know, they, they thrive on data, they thrive on reports, they need to know what their customers are doing, who they are. And again, yeah. 
to be able to go to management and get generate those. It's all about integrating with your systems properly. So those are very yeah. good things for people to keep in mind. Yeah. Uh, as well as from our three panelists, you can see development is a very big skill. Yeah. High in demand, um, networking. Uh, these are things that are we see as well on our end, as well as security, DevOps. Uh, I mean, there is a constant demand for these these types of individuals. And yeah. uh, so it just gives you a brief overview of what to expect. Awesome. Great. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Fariel, in terms of our discussion? Um, you know, we, we I mean, you, you covered off a lot in, in terms of that. I mean, our first question was career paths, possible career yeah. paths in organization. I think you, you covered that and skills. Um, how about workforce I think remote? So. Maybe talk a little bit about what how your organization works. Are you a remote workforce? Uh, so we've gone actually completely remote um, as of the pandemic broke out to like 2020 March. Um, it was honestly a very smooth transition, a lot better than we expected. Uh, there's some tools and uh, tracking mechanisms, obviously, that we've put in place. Um, uh, it's very, I would say, comfortable. I would say, personally, for us, the produ productivity has increased, um, if anything. People are saving time on, like, you know, commuting um, to the office, commuting back to, like, home. Um, everybody surprisingly is available because there's no more excuses, like, okay, I was stuck in traffic. Uh, were you stuck on the way to the staircase? So they are enjoying it. Um, and we have actually have no plans of going, like, you know, uh, hybrid or even back to the office with, like, sad days. Um, a lot of our... Uh, employees used to travel from like, you know, the West End. And if they are being productive at home, we don't really see like a purpose of dragging them into the office. And there's obviously health concerns as well. Um, and I feel like honestly, that's helped us with like retention, considering how competitive the market is going out there. And a lot of people value that because, you know, they have their partners or other uh, friends that are going back to like the office or have like hybrid discussions ongoing. Um, and we don't have anything um, as such, I would say. That's, that's awesome. And just so everyone knows, we experienced when COVID first started, we experienced, or our clients experienced hiccups in the initial phase, getting equipment yeah. out, onboarding people, yeah. getting things organized, getting meetings, planning. But now for the over the past two years, people have gotten used to it and you, it's been streamlined. So most, yeah, for sure. most of our clients have streamlined that process and don't yeah. experience the same issues. And it's pretty second nature at this point for most companies. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it for, it for sure is. And I feel like it, it gives people the peace of mind that I'm not risking my health or if I am living with a dependent that has like a weaker immune system, you know, they are respecting that fact. Um, and you're absolutely right. It has been streamlined a lot. I feel like a lot of smaller businesses also came into existence getting that set up for you because, uh, you know, getting your stuff shipped out through like bigger organizations like Canada Post, DHL, the cost may not be as effective, but there is a lot of people that started doing Doing, uh, things independently over the right, pandemic, right, right. which is suitable for small, medium-sized businesses. Right. Awesome. I agree with you. Listen, in keeping with time for all, Jason, Chris, Fario, that was great. I really appreciate your, uh, your feedback. We'll, we'll come back for Q&A at the end of the session. And just a reminder for, sure. for everyone to please mute your microphone uh, during the discussion. And uh, thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. I want to shift now to our trainer, the trainer part of our discussion. And these are individuals who uh, can talk a little bit about the types of training that's available to people looking to get in to our market or upgrade their skills. So firstly, I'd like to introduce uh, Cheryl Smith from Empower Canada, which provides a 15 week program for youth and young adults with industry certification and job placement support. Welcome Cheryl. Thank you so much. Uh, great discussion, everyone. Craig, it's you're you're doing good work keeping us on well, thank track. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, your your thank you for the the bribe as well. I appreciate it. I mean, uh, <laughs> There'll be more well. coming in the mail. <laughs> exactly. um, next, I'd like to welcome Martha Jez from Fair Chance Learning. Uh, acknowledging the need for supporting future skills and bridging the gap between education and the real world, Fair Chance Learning has partnered with national and internationally recognized organizations to design and deliver industry recognized certifications that support student success and leads to better prepared citizens. Welcome, Martha. Thanks, Craig. Happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. 
Happy to have you. And finally, please welcome Manaj Batarai from uh, YMCA Greater Toronto, who is launching a new 12 to 16 week bridging program for internationally training cloud computing and big data professionals. Welcome. Thanks, Craig. Happy to be here. Awesome. So this is gonna follow a very similar format in terms of our, our employers panel. I have a few questions for each of you. And uh, we'll start with you, Cheryl, to lead us off. Sure. What IT training opportunities does your organization have? All right, so uh, for NPAR Canada, we're currently offering three uh, training programs that we offer three times a year. We offer our junior IT analyst program where participants, and by the way, um, in the interest of full disclosure, all our programs are free. They're completely free. They're funded by our amazing funders. So you don't have to think about covering costs for certification or anything like that. All of it is free. So the three programs that we currently offer, uh, first one is our junior IT analyst program. That program gives uh, anybody who's coming into IT fresh, no pr prior knowledge, no experience, gives them the fundamental training, fundamental knowledge of the IT industry um, where they earn a Google support professional certification Google IT support professional certification over that 15 week period. And we really just take them through what is IT? How, how do you get um, the fundamental inter inf information or the fundamental skill sets for each of the areas? So you'll get an introduction to cybersecurity, et cetera, different, the, the different aspects of IT at an introductory level for that particular course, because it is a beginner program for anybody who's coming into IT, never having any experience or skill set beforehand, and they're coming to learn really what are the fundamentals. We also have another one, which is a new program that we just uh, introduced in January. This is the Google UX design program, and that's for user experience um, designers. And that is um, really one of the areas that we see quite a bit of demand from the employers that we work with. They are looking for user experience or UX designers. And so um, that program was introduced in January and we are, we are, uh, this is the first uh, cohort of that program and it's going swimmingly right now. And um, the third program that we offer is our junior data analyst program. This is more of an intermediate program. Do need some prior knowledge in IT to be able to do this program. Um, in it, I, I, I'm hearing a lot of the themes that we have in this program. Um, throughout the discussions with our employers that we just had, um, Python, machine learning, um, cloud computing, um, AI, um, AI learning and all of that. It's part of the junior data analyst program that we offer. So really these three programs are what we're offering right now. A really great thing about our program is that we offer five years of support. So after that 50, the, the, the initial 15 weeks, we continue to offer five years of support for each of our graduates. And as they go through, we also offer additional free programs that they can do. So they can do project management, for instance, the Google project management um, program where they earn a Google project management certification. So we continue to offer other certifications even after they've completed the core program. And again, all of this is free. I can go mm -hmm. on, but let me stop. <laughs> well, thank you, Cheryl. I think the key term there, first of all, hey, it's a free resource. I think that's amazing. Yeah. I have worked with your organization before and the, the, the candidates you put forward are, are really, really good. They seem to have a very, you know, uh, very friendly, outgoing disposition. I also believe you also help them with their resumes in terms of crafting yes, we that. Do. We noted, we've noted that that they all are very professional, which is also a very important component of, you know, your job search. You know, your resume. Right. You you don't have the opportunity to speak at first. It is your business card. It's your calling card, and it has to look professional and look a certain way to be able to get your foot in the door. And that's a very that's important right. component. And again, to offer free training on these skills that, you know, at the end of the day, we've talked a, a little bit about them on how important they are to be able to get educated in that for free, to be able to go out in the job market and, you know, start at 
I mean, if you're starting in the junior level programs that you're offering, obviously you're getting into an entry level job, mm -hmm. but that's how you get your foot in the door. That's how that's you right. start. You know, that's you, right. you've got to learn to walk before you can run. So that, that's, that's right. Great. That's right. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to direct the same question to, uh, to Martha uh, and ask you about what IT training opportunities does your organization have? Thanks, Craig. And uh, that, that was a great list, Cheryl. I wanted to shout out Tina Stevens and thank her for inviting us into this conversation. We, as you said in your introduction, Craig, we've primarily worked in the education space and realized through the K to career conversations that we were having that there was an opportunity to take our innovative programming to offer it to individuals who are looking to upskill, who are looking to reskill, who are looking to advance in their own jobs. And so have um, started on this path and, and have partnered with Workforce Planning Board in opportunities like this to bring um, training and certification to uh, individuals. So we're based in, in Newmarket, but we are partners with large organizations that were mentioned with um, Chris there before talking about Amazon and Microsoft and cloud and Cheryl talked about Google Cloud. So we're partners of Microsoft and Amazon and offer um, their programming. We also offer programming as it relates to Intuit. Uh, I saw a project management question happening there. So when you're thinking about moving forward from the entry level into industry recognized certifications, um, that's something that we offer. I can put in our website, I'll post it in the chat there, under our certifications. Um, we have put in an application with the Skills Development Fund to, uh, to put a focus in York Region on reskilling and, and offering these services to uh, individuals. Right now, we can offer incredible pricing because we come from the education space. So it's not a consumer price. We, we approach it as a learning um, opportunity. And so we get that um, affordable pricing for individuals who are interested. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just share quickly with respect to the conversations about the role of IT and how that's shifting. What we saw in uh, the education space, and like I said, we work across Canada in K-12 institutions, was that the IT role had to take a leadership role as it navigated through the realities of COVID and moving into a remote scenario where, you know, an educator, um, an administrator was relying on the tools and technology of, of digital tools and technology to foster collaboration and community to do the communication that was mentioned again. So um, IT, the soft skills have become incredibly important as we realize that it's IT who's helping build an infrastructure that really optimizes how well a team works together, whether that team is just IT focused or it's a bank or it's an education institution. So a lot of the courses that we offer allow for those soft skills and, and we don't really call them soft skills. They're, they're incredibly important skills that we need um, our, our citizens and that's why it's in our introduction there. Um, the citizens of York Region and Canada to develop in terms of problem solving and, and making an impact in the, the, the ways that they meet work every day. Very awesome point, especially when it comes to leadership and the way IT is taking more of a, you know, a, a leadership uh, in business. And this is because, you know, business and IT are becoming more hand in hand. As finance, accounting are relying more and the decision makers, the CEOs, the CEOs are relying on IT to run and help their business grow. It's becoming more and more important for IT professionals to be able to have effective communication skills as well as leadership skills to give those, those management team confidence in their abilities and as well help steer them in the right direction to make proper decisions. So this is what we're seeing as well, that IT is becoming a very, very, a much more, not only behind the scenes partner, but in front of the scenes partner in terms of business and how they run. That's so right. And just to answer Mo's question about the CompTIA, um, we have ongoing enrollment, so you can enroll at any time. And then it can be an accelerated pathway, um, depending on how you approach it. But it's about a, anywhere from six to nine weeks, depending on which program you select. But that can be accelerated. Awesome. Great. Um, same question to you, Minaj. Um, 
What IT training opportunities does your organization have? Thank you, Craig. Uh, we have a new, you know, very new Breeze program, which is funded by Under Employment Ontario. So this program is mainly focused on filling the necessary skills and experience gap of newcomers to Canada who have background in IT, cloud computing, and we say and or data analytics. And basically uh, the skills that we cover is essential skills. We call it life skills actually. And you know, we were talking about, we work remotely these days. So self-care is also really important, the mental health and those kind of things. And technical skills, uh, this program is not for someone who doesn't have like, you know, any background in IT, cloud computing and data analytics, because our understanding uh, is these newcomers are really experienced from the country of their origin and they just need like, you know, to fill the gap uh, so that they can excel in Canada. Similarly, we also cover like workplace culture and communication part. That's what we were talking like, you know, how they can blend into the team, that team spirit. And, you know, obviously they need to be self-sufficient to work individually, but at the same time in Canadian organizations, uh, you know, how they can blend themselves into team, those kind of things. We will be like, you know, uh, running this program in collaboration with uh, Seneca College. So technical parts will be trained by Seneca College and we are there to support uh, with other aspects. And uh, we also provide like, you know, sector specific pre-employment and wrap up services. So, so that they would know how to explore opportunities and so on. Uh, so this program is uh, basically for 12 to 16 weeks. So in the first eight weeks, uh, they will focus in intense uh, training and then one month of mandatory placement to get that Canadian kind of experience. But if a participant like, you know, fails to get more experience and if the employer also agrees, the placement can be extended to another one month. And Seneca College will train our participant for up to 100 hours, including various topics in cloud computing, virtualization, databases, big data, data science and analytics. So the beauty of this program is not like, you know, individually either cloud computing or big data. It's uh, in between both of them so that they can have like, you know, uh, different career paths and opportunities as well. So we will be mainly focusing, I'm not the right person to talk about technical aspect, but I can tell you, we will be more focusing on Azure, but there will be exposure to other uh, main uh, cloud service providers as well. Awesome, thank you. You know, uh, again, you know, very informative and touching on some things that are very, very important in our industry. I mean, you mentioned newcomers to Canada. Good organizations uh, are looking for newcomers to Canada because as I mentioned at the beginning of all of this, there is a big talent shortage here in Ontario, well, in Canada, in our industry. And, you know, we're always on the lookout for good talent coming from abroad, people who have good experience. The challenge sometimes they face is integrating into our culture, integrating into corporate Canada, it's a little bit different. It can present some challenges in terms of how we communicate with each other, how business operates here. And it's great that you're offering something to help individuals be able to understand, you know, the differences between their native country and how corporate Canada will work to be able to help them and make them more employable. Because at the end of the day, usually they have all the skills that are required. The only thing they're lacking is their understanding of how even as simple as the interview process works, how to write a resume. How, how to interview, how to present certain skills, how to listen as opposed to talk. All of those things are very, very key. And, you know, you can characterize them as, you know, soft skills or however you want to. It's just there are some fundamental differences that we've noted. And it's always good that there, you know, there's a resource out there that somebody can go to and sort of get a little more background to help them and put in their toolkit when they go into the job market or they look to move along their, their IT career. So thank you. Um, we're going to move on to uh, next question. Uh, so we'll start with you, Martha. And the uh, question is, what individuals are eligible for your training? So uh, 
right now with the, just with respect to the skills development fund, we put an emphasis on youth and those looking to start into um, their employment. But that being said, the opportunity is for any um, individual to take the certification. A couple of highlights about the program is that it is asynchronous. So um, while you know you don't have to show up at a certain time, we understand that people have busy lives and they have to fit it in where they can. Um, and we're there from the pre-assessment all the way to the certification. So you get a learning coach with Fair Chance Learning, and you have the opportunity to book your exam and have a proctor um, who supports you right until you gain your certification. So that pathway we find is a pathway for success. It's one that um, you'll see that our symbol there is an individual. We call them the, the celly. So we like to wrap our, our arms around an individual on this learning journey to make sure that they feel supported um, from start to finish there. And um, in terms of what they can expect, you know, enroll whenever you're you're ready to enroll. Take it at the pace that you need. Have a learning coach who can check in and say, "Hey, you haven't logged in a couple times, or you've got this many modules to complete," and um, get you into the certification. If you do fail your first time, that's okay. It's the first attempt in learning, um, so you have an opportunity to retake your exam as part of the package. And um, in terms of the the bigger heavy stack that they were talking, uh, the, the first panelists were talking about, the, um, the software can sit in a virtual, um, in the virtual environment. So if you only have a Chromebook, uh, you can still be taking Adobe suite of product and, and get the training that you need to get ultimate certification. So from an investment side of things, if you don't want to invest up front in, in heavy duty technology, you have the opportunity to do the modules online, which is a benefit for all. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Minaj, same question. You may have covered a lot of this in you know, our previous question, but you know, what individuals are eligible for your training? I, I would say I will come to like, you know, very specific eligibilities, but I would say that they need to be very openness to learn new things. And you know, it's a 16 to 18, uh, I mean, 12 to 16 weeks uh, intense uh, full-time commitment kind of things are something that I wanted to focus more. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, they need to be, uh, par the participants needs to be like, you know, 18 years of age at least, and should be resident of Ontario based on our funders kind of things, have at least a Canadian language benchmark of level seven and above have at least two years of education in IT, cloud computing, and or data analytics with at least one year of experience or a combination of three years. Okay. And I would also say, I would also say participants should be newcomer and people who are living less than five years in Canada are considered as the newcomer for this program. Uh, in terms of their immigration status, they could be refugee claimant with a valid work permit, permanent resident, convention refugee, and naturalized Canadian uh, citizen. Those are all eligible to apply to this program. Awesome. Great. And uh, now to you, Cheryl, same question. What uh, individuals are eligible for your training? Okay, so for NPAR Canada, for our training, <clears throat> you can be over 17. Uh, 17 to 30 is one of our target demographics, so a youth population, but we do have limited spaces in our upcoming program. So we have May upcoming for 2022 and September as well. We do have continuous um, registration. So every anybody can register at any time, but we have limited spacing spaces for 31 and over 17 to 30 is open right now we also ask that um, everybody who comes to us would have completed high school their ged their dogwood whatever it is called in in um and wherever everyone originates is fine as long as you've completed high school somewhere in the world doesn't necessarily have to be from canada from anywhere in the world we're good to go um, also if uh, we're also looking for um, Canadian language benchmark of seven or higher as well, or um, IELTS at um, six or higher, 
And we also accept um, the following statuses, citizen, permanent resident, um, convention refugee, refugee claimant, and work permit holder. So whichever one of those statuses that is held, we're good to go as long as you are legally able to work in Canada. And um, our program is from 8.45 till 1, Monday to Friday for the 15 weeks that we have it. It is, uh, it is a live class, so you will be in a class with an instructor. You can get the support that you need there. We also have peer mentors. We have uh, an array of staff. There is at least there are at least eight staff members in every single class that we have. And so you have quite an array of support from everybody who is there. We have um, at least two instructors in each class. We also ask, um, so for the 15 weeks, commit to Monday to Friday, 8.45 till one after one, your time is up to you. And we also have everybody working with their um, placement specialist from week five of our program. And so 80% of our, of, our, of our students get placed in jobs within six months of graduating. That six month period, we, we've said six months all along, that six month period during the pandemic has been shortened to four months. So we are really seeing as, as has been said throughout this conversation that the demand for technically trained professionals is really, really increasing. And it is something that we are working and doing our best to help with in our society, because we know we have so many people who are looking for work. We wanna make sure that we're matching them with, with um, jobs that are commensurate to their education and, and certification levels. Awesome, that's great and thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we have one more question. And um, we'll, we'll start with you, Minaj. Uh, do you see any current trends in IT training? Uh, you know, I'll start by me, myself, because, um, you know, I don't have IT background, but what I see is I, I, I'm so lucky to be in this era. I have witnessed from DOS to all the way, like, you know, uh, up to now, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic process automation, AS computing, quantum computing, virtual reality, blockchain, internet of things. So I personally have like, you know, witnessed these things, even though I may not have those like, you know, technical background, but I hear every day and how that is impacting our business, not just for big business, even for small business, you know, uh, I see uh, since the pandemic or even before the pandemic, that technological outburst is there. So I see a lot of jobs, in, especially in cloud computing and big data. Uh, just a simple like, you know, job search this morning, I found almost like 600 jobs in cloud computing and, and 400 jobs mm -hmm. for like, you know, big data in the region of field uh, within the last uh, couple of weeks. So I see this, uh, you know, technology, uh, you know, industry is increasing. But at the same time, what I see a big gap is, are we humanizing our techno technologically professional people? At the end of the day, they have to work to create something. They have to work for like, you know, their clients. That part, that trend I see really lacking. And at the same time, cloud computing and big data, it's just not like technical aspects. There are management aspects like uh, as well, like uh, cloud governance's roles. One who is like, you know, able to assess uh, like, you know, cloud need of an individual organization, the deployment expert. Um, I see those, uh, you know, new uh, families of job coming up. That's what I can see. Awesome. Cheryl, same question to you. Do you see any current trends in IT training? Um, right now in IT training, from, from our perspective, we have found that the remote learning model is very, very popular. Um, as before the pandemic, and I want to try to go back there, um, we were in person as well, but we had started the conversation about um, having online programs, having online training. We are a, an IT training organization. That is our focus. That's all we do is we train IT. And so we started having the conversation. So when the 
the pandemic came or when we had to be shut down because of the pandemic, we were already having those conversations. So we enacted what we had been thinking or researching beforehand. So our transition was not as rocky as others that I have, um, that we have helped navigate as well. So um, we have found that with the pandemic, we are, we have a greater, a higher um, success rate from our participants. We have more people who are able to complete the program. Um, and in terms of what it is that we are hearing from our employers, as was said before, data, lots of, of um, AI learning, all of the automation, all of these things. Security is also a big thing that we hear about. And also just having more, more of more trained professionals in the IT industry, just more of everybody is what is needed because there is that shortage in the workforce. So we have a lot of people who are an upskilling as well with more people who are their jobs, more of their work is being automated. Um, more people want to be uh, upskilled to, to transition into other areas of work, other types of work because their job may become obsolete because of automation. So it's really, um, those are the trends that we're hearing and that we're addressing in our, in our, the programs that we offer and in how and who we offer them to. We used to be a youth only program, but with the upskilling um, demand that we've seen, we're now offering the program to anyone who is 31 and over as well. So it's not just 17 to 30 anymore. We're also offering um, the program to 31, anyone who's 31 years old and older. So um, just I, listening to those question, trends. There's a question in the chat that asked that very, you know, if you offer it to over 30, so that's great to hear. Yes, we do. <laughs> Awesome, and we've you've also touched on a few points. Remote learning, obviously, as we've progressed in COVID, that's gotten more streamlined. People have gotten used to it. People now it's their new norm. So this is you know uh, as we've gotten better with it, and same as doing this, people have gotten used yeah. to Zoom, MS Teams, WebEx, all the things and technologies that are out there. You get used to it, you get better at it, you understand what the limitations are, and people right. become their new norm. So remote learning is big. Security is something we see huge. I mean, as we're all relying on technology, unfortunately, you have those that are looking to bring us down, bring yeah. to hack into our systems, create havoc, uh, and therefore security has been a very big growth sector. And there, mm -hmm. there is just simply a huge demand. And you know what's what's important is for people to understand that look, it's a great field to go into, and I think it takes time. It's something that you need to graduate into. You know, um, just because you've, you've, you've supported some network troubleshooting doesn't make you a security expert. These are very, you know, skills that right. take time to, to, to get adept at. So this is, right. this is the thing that we are seeing and, uh, you know, very important. Just one um, thing before we, 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 we move on. We also provide support for anyone who doesn't have access to laptops or Wi-Fi. We, oh, wow. we understand that there is that, um, that, uh, problem that some people may be having as well, you know, not having the access to what is needed. So we do provide um, laptops, loaner laptops, and we do provide Wi-Fi for anyone for the duration of our program who doesn't have access to it. That's amazing. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, you know, same question uh, for you, Martha. Uh, do you see any current trends in IT training? Yeah, I would say uh, a couple of trends, one being the individual owning their certification. So whether you're starting a job or in a role right now, there's the, the trends towards lifelong learning and the, the individual owning their certifications and their credentials. And so you see things like um, badging and, and um portfolios, digital portfolios that the individual carries with them. And I think that's an important piece for the um, people tuning in today. And I saw a question like, you know, is co-op the right place to get started to get my foot in the door? I would say certainly building your narrative and your experience of the work that you've done and telling it from your perspective. So again, that communication piece becomes a really important piece 
of who you are as an individual and what contributions you have um, offered to a company, but also how you've committed to lifelong learning. So um, that's really important. So think about your portfolio, maybe not necessarily just a resume, but whether it's a LinkedIn portfolio, whether it's your Credly badges, or um, dare I say blockchain um, credentials. These are the, these are the, future looking ways that people will be validating your skills alongside the, the communication side of things. And then um, with respect to micro credentialing, just this reality that the way that technology is innovating and the, at the speed and pace is that there's a real need for an individual, not just to enter a role as an analyst in, in 2020 and think that, you know, that's, that's where their learning stops, that this is an aggressive learning cycle. So you have to be comfortable learning um, and upskilling and, and reaching out to your network to do that but also just um, finding those opportunities to, to make that happen. And then, um, you know, it, it, and again, it doesn't stop at post-secondary. It doesn't stop with a college diploma. It's about how you keep continuing that, that learning curve uh, and which recognition um, certifying body is important for your skill set and your, your expertise. So, you know, industry recognition is equally important at, um, to a diploma at this stage age when we're thinking about employment and career. Awesome. Um, you know, you brought up also a very good point, Martha, lifelong learning. So one of the things we've noted in the people who are very successful at the very top of our industry um, is they've gotten there, the majority of them, because they continually, they are open to lifelong learning. They are open. They're constantly upgrading their skills. They are constantly learning. They're constantly certifying for new things getting educated, training in different things to be able to advance their career. It's not just, oh, I got the certification and therefore, you know, I am going to have a job for life. It doesn't always end up like that. And oftentimes those that advance the best, the fastest and the highest are those who embrace, you know, always, always looking to learn new things, whether it be professionally, whether it be, you know, getting certifications or whether it be at work, you know, touching on new technologies, getting their hands getting, you know, feeling for what that technology can do and becoming adept at it. Those are the people that generally go far in our, in our industry. So thank you. Um, so uh, we're gonna turn things back to actually Kayla now is gonna discuss a little bit about York Region Employment Services Network, uh, which is better known as Employment Ontario. And she's gonna touch on uh, the support Employment Ontario centers uh, who can help your job with your job search goals. Uh, there are financial support and employment services. So uh, Kayla, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us. Yes, thank you, Craig. Um, I do want to note, so uh, after this um, event, we are going to send an email with all the information that uh, contact information of the trainers. Um, we do, EO centers do work with these organizations on a regular basis, and we are aware of other opportunities as well. IT accelerator program is something Access is working on right now. So we do have a lot of great information that I, so reaching out to us is always a good idea. Um, so as I mentioned before, we are provincially funded and here to support the community. There are financial supports and employment services available. And I'm just going to quickly touch on some of the ones, um, but you can always learn more from your local EO center. Um, at the bottom of this slide is that link again for you to find your local EO center. So for financial supports, um, if you would like to go through us, there are two programs. Uh, one is Second Career and one is the Canada Ontario Job Grant. Second Career is a program that aims to help people rejoin the workforce quickly. The program focuses on supporting training programs that take 52 weeks or less, including micro-credentials. The program can cover a portion of the training costs and basic living expenses. The maximum is $28,000 available per applicant, um, but it is a case-by-case -case on how much funding an individual does receive. The Canada Ontario Job Grant, also known as COJ, it provides the opportunity for employers to invest in the workforce. The program provides financial supports for employers to cover a portion of the training costs. It is a maximum of $10,000 for a current employee and $15,000 for a new hire. So if you are going to a new organization and you are missing a skill, 
college will completely cover the cost to upgrade that skill. And you can work with the employer and us to hopefully get that application through. So if you want to learn a little bit more, because there is a lot of information on both programs to determine if you are eligible and suitable for this funding support, please reach out to your closest EO center and they'll be happy to discuss these programs further with you. For the employment services support, um, there is career exploration and assessment. So this is helping us to create a job search plan to reach your long-term goals. There are monthly workshops and events um, such as this one and many more that all the centers put on. There is contact with local employers. So we are looking to match and fill job openings in the York region community. And then we do have specialized employment services. Specifically, there are some for youth, newcomers, women, and pe people with disabilities. All these services are created to help job search plans. So you have the necessary tools and information to attain your long-term job search goals. We are here to help. So I highly recommend you consider using us and our free services. And thank you for your time. Awesome. Thanks, Kayla. That's great. Good information. And hopefully uh, you folks will uh, be able to take advantage of some of those programs. Um, we're now coming to the uh, Q&A portion uh, of, of our webinar. And uh, I saw there were some questions in the chat. I saw some have been answered and probably a lot have been answered during our discussion. But uh, I'll ask Leslie if there are any questions that have come up that you know, remain outstanding or that you know, are pertinent that we can talk to and maybe ask our panelists to sort of answer. Thank you, Greg. Fantastic conversations with our panelists. Uh, yes, there are some questions that I've been monitoring uh, and I will read them. Uh, so first question is from Matthew. Uh, he's asking for junior roles, uh, is core the best way to enter? And he said he's ha he has several certificates and tried to build a profile with volunteering experience, but with not much luck in landing interviews. Uh, practical experience seems to be what the employers are looking for. Is there a way to substantially build on this on your own? You know, I'll, I'll, I can start us off on answering that question to a degree. I mean, co-op is a great thing to have because it's practical experience in a real work environment, right? You know, I guess the, the, the thing is to understand, you know, what types of roles you're applying for. You know, as a co-op, as a company, there's only so many roles that they're going to allow a co-op student to start in. They're not going to hand over the keys to their company at the very first day. You know, you obviously have to prove yourself. I mean, when we start talking about network or security or cloud computing, all of those can shut a company down. So generally, when it comes to co-op students, they're going to start at the entry level of a particular job, whether it be an entry level developer, an entry level support analyst. Those are generally like starting points and, you know, maximizing your, your personality, your abilities, your communication to be able to then start getting your foot into the door to be able to move towards, you know, more of what you really want to end up with doing in your IT career. So you have to start somewhere and it's generally going to be the, you know, the entry level positions, wherever they may be in your particular discipline. So that, that would be, you know, my answer for that question. I don't know, anyone on our panel want to, want to address that one as well? Um, hey, uh, I think I can answer as a co-op student myself and, uh, and a hirer um, occasionally of, of co-ops. Uh, yeah, I mean, so as like tiny bit of additional background for, uh, so I have a computer science and a business background. And uh, as a part of my schooling, the, uh, I had five co-op terms and I think co-op, people rave about it. There's a bunch of people who rave about it and people who are like, oh yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's good and it's important and it sounds good. But I think even with the people who rave about co-op, I think it is a fantastic experience um, for the circumstances that it um, went, when and where it fits. Um, and when you have the opportunity to do so, um, I think where co-op is particularly beneficial is in you, of course, getting that on the ground experience and getting kind of on ramped into a particular role and area and field. But, uh, and I think someone just mentioned is I think it's really about learning for yourself what you like, what you don't like, where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are. So you can lean into whatever those strengths are 
you can uh, work on building out, let's say, uh, weaknesses. And you can also just get a better idea for how you want to path and map out your career. Because I do know that, um, from my understanding, many of the people on the call are relatively early career and relatively junior. But a lot of what you learn across co-ops and your first roles and getting started can really help as far as mapping out what you want your career to look like five or 10 years from now. And I also believe that uh, many employers will actually ask that question about what you want in the next five and 10 years. And, uh, you know, being able to answer that through previous co-op experiences is really, really beneficial. Yeah, you, you bring up a very good point, Chris. At the end of the day, it is to sort of understand, okay, where do I want to get to in my career? What, you know, if I had a magic wand, where would I, what would my career look like? And realize that it takes steps to get there. And how do you bridge that gap from where you are today to where you want to go? And how are you going to do that? And creating a progressive plan. And it's not necessarily always going to work out 100% as planned, but always shifting as you learn new skills and notice the things that you like and enjoy to do, it's important to sort of, you know, make those shifts and, you know, and the market too, you can't predict that 100% either, make those shifts to be able to move along your career path, I think is very important. So awesome. Um, does anyone else want to add to that discussion that, you know, for this question, or should we move on to the next question? Okay, uh, Leslie, I think uh, we've covered that one. Uh, but again, if there's any questions we don't get to, you want to have more questions, certainly can email and uh, we will look into them and you know answer them that way. Okay, so our next question is from Anna. She says she has uh, seen job postings that ask for a bachelor's degree. Uh, she will be graduating with a diploma. Uh, should she continue to apply for these jobs anyway, or is it pointless? Great question. Um, again, I mean, I can start us off on this one. It really depends on the company and the company culture. A lot of companies like to put that in there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is absolutely required. I guess the best way to examine that is the type of role that you're applying for. You know, if it's a very senior role in a lot of places, a lot of senior roles may require this. If it's an entry level requirement, it's probably a nice to have, you know, um, it depends, it varies from company to company. I wouldn't say that you're, you're wasting your time by applying per se, but you know, at the same token, what you can do is you can ask. You know, so, so you know, when you're applying for a job, just sending out a resume is a very passive experience. Um, a lot of people think, oh, I'm working so hard, I'm sending out thousands of resumes, I'm doing a great job on my job search. But honestly, you don't know where those resumes are going. You don't know if that's actually a live job you don't know who's receiving them. So what you can try and do is find out who the hiring manager is, who the talent acquisition manager is, the HR manager, and simply ask, hey, you know, you know, if you're honest and you're upfront, and even if you don't get them live, if you leave a message in their voicemail, and that's probably the best way I would start, you, you humanize yourself. And if your, your English language skills are really good, you certainly make yourself stand out from the crowd. So leaving a message in the hire in the HR manager's voicemail to say, hey, I've applied for this role. Uh, I think I'm a very good candidate. I have all of these skills. However, I don't have a bachelor's degree. I'm not sure if you'd consider me, but I wanted to let you know that I'm very interested in this position. If they get back to you, that's great. And if they don't, it's it's still, you know, it allows you to, to be that one step ahead of potentially other candidates. So that's the way I would handle it. Anyone on our panel have any uh, any thoughts around that? And I, I, I think, uh, you know, I am completely in agreement with you, Craig, but at least that person will start like, you know, reviewing organization and, you know, job posting and see, okay, what is my gap? If, if just this education is left, what can I, you know, get the things to fill that gap? So uh, obviously it's always worth it to, you know, connect with employer and see if there is any other possibility, if not that exactly. Awesome. Yeah, no, I agree. Anyone else will have uh, want to jump uh, in on this? Yeah, I think just adding to what you said, Craig, it's definitely important to reach out to, like you said, the hiring manager. Um, oftentimes, um, it's just an option there. You may select it in 
error. Uh, you know, people that post jobs can do that as well, and then they would be able to clarify it. I also feel like it makes you stand out because it just showcases that you're more serious about the job and you're not just a resume or like a number of an applicant in there. Um, and even if they weren't going to review your resume because you didn't have that particular diploma or degree, but simply because you sent like a personalized message, you will at least have the opportunity for them to review your resume and share their feedback. Absolutely. It definitely makes you stand out. It definitely puts you, most people don't do that. So it's definitely an advantage to do it. And yeah, it's more work, but you know, finding a job is work. You have to treat it as your job. It's a Monday to Friday, nine to five position. You can't spend 15 minutes in the morning just sending out resumes and hope something's gonna stick. You really have to work at it. You have to network yourself. You have to you know, reach out to potential employers as best as you can directly. You know, and in a professional manner, if you're honest, if you're open, if you're professional, people like that. You know, People wanna help you find a job. It's just a question of how you approach it. And being honest is, is probably the most important thing, you know, because even if it's not for this particular job, if you're trying to oversell yourself, in future, if you are honest and open and friendly, when other roles come up, they're going to consider you first or that are a match for you, or they'll refer you to other people that may have a job that may be a fit. Happens to us all the time. Awesome. Um, Leslie? Any other questions? Yes, uh, we have uh, other questions as well. Uh, <clears throat> we have a question from Naziha, uh, and she was asking uh, specifically to Cheryl, uh, but I believe this question may have been answered already, but I'll read it anyway. So it, mm -hmm. it says, hi, Cheryl. Can you please let us know about the eligibility to get into one of your programs? All right. So let me just go over it again really quickly. As long as you're over the age of 17, you can apply to a program. Bearing in mind that anyone who's 31 and over, there are limited spots available. Um, you must have completed high school and be legally able to work in Canada and just be able to commit Monday to Friday for the 15 weeks that we have the program. So our next program start days date is on May 24th. 15 weeks takes us up to the first week of September. And then from September to December would be our next cohort for the year. Um, all our programs are open to everyone. So you can apply for any one of the programs that you're interested in. And um, if you need any support with any uh, with laptops or with um, Wi-Fi, please indicate that when you fill in the application. I have posted a form in the chat. That form is only to connect with me. I'll send you details and send you the link to the application when I do my follow-up to all, anybody who has completed that form. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Next question, awesome. Leslie. Yes. Uh, next question is from... Aditya, uh, and uh, Aditya is asking, if I want to become a project manager in IT, do you have a program which I can take? So I guess this is going to go towards any of our trainers. Any of our trainers, yeah. I, any of our trainers want to jump in yeah, on I, I would say, I, I would say like, you know, I think all of uh, our training programs that has certain level of like, you know, skills needed for, I, I mean, you know, project management, because these days we have to follow on limited budget as well as timeline outcomes, the stakeholders. So somehow here and there people would learn how to manage the project in every kind of training. But if, um, you know, uh, the questioner is asking specifically project management, perhaps there is a certification route and, you know, certificate programs in, in different uh, colleges and universities. That's what I can say. Sorry, just to quickly touch on. Oh, sorry. Um, and this is where second career and college can come into play because you do get the choice of your trainer. Um, so if you have an employer in mind and you just need a bit of more education, um, the COJG program is a definite option to upgrade that skill. And, and there are also, certification programs for uh, Also to jump in. Sorry, Craig, go ahead. Go ahead, Cheryl. Sorry. Um, to jump in here, um, we do offer the um, Google Project Management Certification um, as part of our program offerings. That's at the, after completing the core programs, which are the junior IT programs that I spoke about earlier, um, 
any of our alumni is able to complete the Google Project Management certification free of charge um, and work towards their um, PMP from there. So you get um, designated hours, et cetera, and experience in uh, project management as well from NPAR Canada. Yeah, that's that's great, Cheryl, because, you know, the standard is the is PMP certification for project management. So to be able to get that certification, I mean, some employers, that's very, very important to them. Not all. Some of them, it's, it's an asset. And then generally, just to sort of, you know, go over in brief, to be able to become a, a project manager, generally, it starts in like a as a project coordinator. Uh, project control officer, those are generally more of the junior areas to start focusing on, gaining some experience there to graduate. That's generally the career progression we see for project managers. You know, but at the end of the day, any IT professional can become a project manager. You know, it's just a question of understanding, you know, what's involved, the overall A to Z of managing a project. And that can come through either the training of, you know, PMP, or having graduated from you know, lesser uh, titles as a project coordinator or a project control officer. So hope that answers your question. Um, Leslie, any other questions? Yes, uh, I'm uh, unless... I'm sorry, um, I, sorry, I needed to extend my question again. Um, uh, to Martha, because she has shared one certification, of course. Um, is this preparation uh, towards the PMI certification free of cost? Martha, are you there? Thanks, Craig. Yes, yes. So there is, it's not free of cost, no. But if you okay. reach out, we can talk about like funding programs that are available for individuals when it comes to mm -hmm. sourcing certification. So, so uh, essentially I'm current, like we are talking about someone who is no experience in project management. However, I do have some experience, not in Canada, of course, um, but I'm currently studying a uh, course uh, to gain that education, which is very specific to IT industry. So it's a graduate certificate in project management IT. Mm -hmm. So I have been talking to many individuals who have been working in the industry and uh, currently I want to know a way wherein I can work through and uh, reach the position where I want to work on. Um, so I have had some reviews for people to go with CAPM and I was not sure whether to get a training for that or maybe attempt it myself. So if some of the trainers could um, talk about it, maybe then it would, this session would really help me. Yeah, I mean, Tina had posted about second careers, so I don't know if there's a, a particular service that would help support you as you're lining up, you know, your certification and credentials and how they line up here. Um, I was, I attended the Future Skills Summit last um, week, and they, there was a, an organization there who helped with aligning um, skills and certifications from outside of Canada to inside Canada. So I can um, follow up with their, I have to track them down, but I'm happy to follow up with them and, and share their contact to help if that would help you. And I, I can, I can uh, add to this one as well. Uh, at Access, we have uh, several bridging programs uh, for newcomers uh, in IT that, um, you know, you may be able to um, get some support in. So we will post that information at the end of this uh, event. You will send an email with all the resources and uh, you can contact any of our bridging programs uh, for next steps. Awesome, thanks, Leslie. Uh, maybe we have, uh, and keeping in mind with the time. Uh, yeah, we have a, a couple more questions. I think we have maybe a few more, a couple more, time for two more questions, as a matter of fact. Uh, but the next question may have already been answered by Cheryl, but I will ask anyways for the benefit of those who may not have uh, joined it as, as at that time. And it's from Burrell, uh to Cheryl. Uh, Burrell is asking, when and how do we apply for the 31 and over uh, program? So I guess uh, for people who are over the age of 31. Okay, so the the 31, uh, the 30, for those who are 31 and over, um, the application is in, is the same application process as applying for the program. So all the 
everyone is able to apply for any of the programs at any time. Right now we're accepting applications for our May cohort. So now would be a good time since we have limited spots for those who are 31 and over. Now would be a good time to apply for one of our programs that is of interest to you, even though our, our cohort starts in May because the demand for though for um, reskilling and upskilling for for 31 and over is very, very high. And so you want to apply earlier in this in the in the process and make sure that your application is in for early consideration. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. And our very last question is from Mo. Uh, Mo's asking uh, um, actually uh, I answered this question in the chat, but I'll read it out for the benefit of others who may not have seen it. And he's asking how would he specifically find if a program that he's looking to get into, a training program that he's looking to get into, will be accepted uh, for the second career category? Um, so Mo, and for the benefit of anybody else who was thinking about this, if you are interested in applying for the second career uh, for training, you can contact one of the many uh, employment service providers in York region. And I put the, the link uh, from the Workforce Planning Board's uh, website in the, in the chat, but we will also provide that information uh, as part of the uh, resource information that we will provide through email. But you can basically book an appointment with any of the service providers in York region, the one that is closest to, to you, uh, you can do that. And usually the appointment takes about an hour and it, it is at no cost to you. And uh, you meet with an employment consultant who will do an assessment uh, and, and to see your eligibility and suitability for the second career uh, uh, program. And then they will take it from there. Uh, and the next steps will be to gather information that is required to complete your application. So for starters, just make an appointment with one of the service providers uh, in your region and then book an appointment and the appointment is free. And as I mentioned earlier, it takes just about an hour to complete the assessment process. And just to build on that, sorry, Leslie, is the one-on-one -on -one is very necessary. It is unfortunately a complicated program and it's not black and white. So really having that person to talk to you, they can give advice on your specific situation and research your specific situation. So it is beneficial. Awesome. 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 And that concludes our questions, uh, Craig. Yeah, that concludes our questions. And obviously, if there's any others, I, I imagine, Leslie, you'll be, you know, monitoring that and, you know, responding and providing links accordingly to be able to, you know, access these resources that we've been talking about. Is that that's correct, Leslie? Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. So, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for joining today. I hope... Uh, you got some good information from this session. I hope that you learned a little bit and certainly what's available in our region. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank our participants, uh, our employers, our trainers for taking time out of their busy day to uh, you know, enhance our discussion and give guidance to all of those of you looking to enhance your IT careers or even just get into IT. Uh, we'll be following up via email with some information we provided you today. And uh, remember the York Region Employment Ontario Centers and Workforce Planning Board, their are community resources available to help you take advantage of uh, their knowledge, resources to uh, better approach your future job. And I uh, wanted to wish everyone uh, health, happiness, stay safe, be well, and best of luck in your, uh, in your job search. Bye everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.